We're running very late. All right, so this is part two, right? Sandra. I got it. I know, you know, <laughs> I'm on it today. <laughs> I was taking no chances. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, just a brief recap. Now, everybody, I understand that everybody here was also here last week. So this is what we covered, just as a refresher. Whoops, I need to get rid, I need to move my, there we go. All right. I talked about where all this methodology comes from. I gave you my resources, my reading program, my Facebook connection, my YouTube connection. All right, whoops, here we go. All right, my Down syndrome reading programs, teaching reading for meaning, that is the whole point, that's what we're doing. High interest base and why that's essential, we talked about that, strategies. Very simple, just three, fast flash, sandwich style teaching, errorless testing. All right, and again, fast flash, the child does not repeat the word, the child does not repeat the word. If you remember that video from last week, the child is just watching and that is exactly what we need for the brain. Much less the articulation problem, for example, that the mom was that said birthday, I mean, come on. <laughs> that is not easy to say anyway. So, but we just don't go there for the sake of the brain. All right, and then your homework. So, um, and we talked, we had, since we got started late, those who arrived early, we talked about their personal pages. And I'm happy to stay on at the end and please show me what you brought because it's really important. If you've gotten kind of off track, I need to put you on track before you create a whole bunch more, all right? And everything you know is in this book, all the details, everything about everything I'm talking about, except the personal pages, but you got that as a handout. All right, we go in through the heart and teach to the brain. All right, so this time, this today we're covering entirely different things, all right? So how do we go in through the heart? How do we do that before we teach the brain? Personal pages, you're pros on that almost. <laughs> you've done, you've tried that. Personal books, lotto games, and modified books. By modified books, I mean modified trade books like Frozen and, uh, you know, Rapunzel, etc. All right. All of these, everything I just showed you is explained in detail, in detail, even more probably than I'm going to tell you right now. So this is an example of a personal book. You also have the advantage of last week, we had the mom the, who's a pediatrician and Anna, her little girl who were reading a personal book. Remember what that looked like? It was huge, huge type all by itself. You turn the page and then you get this nice big picture with slightly smaller type. All right, so this is the ideal. Left pages are blank. Okay, what's wrong with this one? And you can unmute yourself. Okay, Victoria. So the left page is not blank. They have the writing on the left page. Yeah, so this is not reading. So many folks get this wrong, I think. So then the next page would be, I like Anna, picture of Anna. Excuse me, that's not reading. We're just, <laughs> you know, they know the whole book is about I like, and they see the picture, they're not reading. So we don't do that. The very first thing we show them is just a text line. They are actually reading. All right, then they get the reward. All right, so this is another one, don't do. Why would that be? Any volunteers? Why isn't this right? What's wrong with that? Well, the answer is that the picture is tiny. Our kids are having to work really hard at learning to read. We want a nice big fat reward, not a tiny little picture. All right, <clears throat> so this is a higher level, this is great. Uh, you notice on the second page where you have this nice big picture, I had to reduce the type quite a bit. That's fine. And besides, this is at a higher level. But notice the one at top, the line at this picture at top, tons of white space. I talked about white space last week. We have to tell the brain where to look. And we have to help the brain to focus. The brain is not distracted by there's a picture over here. Not till they get better. Once they're more advanced with reading, piece of cake, not a problem. You can have the picture across in the type. It enhances, that's great. 
but because by that point they're not struggling to read every word all right so this is great <clears throat> all right how do you progress the reader through personal books okay this is easy longer sentences smaller type more text on a page and you incorporate higher word lists but that takes time your first books are going to be with huge type <clears throat> And you will be able to tell because you're the mom and you're intuitive when you can get a little smaller. <clears throat> you would be amazed that eventually they can be tiny type, but not now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Lotto on matching games. That's what these are about. This is a set that I offer on my site. There's six different sets. Two animals, big animals, little animals, fruit, food, colors. <clears throat> and then the last one at the bottom on the right that's just for the parents because our kids do not know how they don't want to know how to wait, whoa, wait a minute they don't want to know how to wash their hands i mean i you know years and years and years you're saying okay and you squirt the soap i'm done right so this is trying to teach them how to wash their hands all right <clears throat> all right now when you make this yourself when you make this yourself, this is a sample of my big animal uh, lotto game. And it's eight and a half by 11, it's a regular size sheet. <clears throat> now notice, look at the word board. Nothing is in the same position as the picture. This is crucial because there's a, there's a company that produced like, and I won't mention their names, <clears throat> 28 of these sets. And they just took, they just, the word board was, elephant was right up there on the left and horse was right up there on the right at the top. And I thought, you, what are you thinking? <clears throat> you have to totally scramble the order because our kids are fabulous picture memorizers. They memorize positions with pictures. So for example, if you had copied the identical order of the animals for the word board, an elephant was up top left and you hand the child the picture of the elephant and you ask him to put it on the right place on the word board he's going to go up top left because he remembers where the elephant picture was okay they're very our kids are so smart that way so you scramble the order so there's no way he can use that as a crutch okay modified books <clears throat> speaking of frozen all right um, so on the left, lower left, that's the trade book as it is, as it comes off the shelf. And on the right, <clears throat> this is how I've modified it. Now, your modifications are permanent because you're using uh, labels, you know, Avery permanent labels, uh, shipping labels. So the difference that this makes, if you will just look at this as if you're a six-year-old girl, the difference if I put the one on the left in front of you and say, now we're going to learn to read this and I'm going, ah. <laughs> oh, no, we're not. <laughs> if I put the one on the right, you're just totally into it. Number one, because you already know Anna, because you're crazy about the movie, you can read Anna. And then, oh, no, is emotionally charged. That's easy to learn. And then you have two words, rides and falls. <clears throat> so these books are fabulous tools if you're willing to put in the time to do it. All right, here's one that I modified. I wanted the whole book to be about so-and-so loves something. Bert loves pigeons, Ernie loves drums, uh, Count loves numbers, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I sacrificed the rhyming. This is not a read aloud. <clears throat> We're in many instances transforming read alouds into reading books. And the cool thing is, of course, that it looks like the books that their peers may be reading. <clears throat> now, here's a, uh, this is one of the uh, Step Into Reading series, which are the best. They, they do the best job. They don't do a perfect job, but they do the best job at sort of coming close to the ideal. But they also do something stupid. <clears throat> Who would put black type against a dark background? Well. Trade book publishers will, because they're just not thinking. So that's very hard to read. So then you can just, you can 
either take it, and this was at a level, the words these and are is a higher level. That's not your very first dolce level. <clears throat> but if you have a kid reading at that level, great. Then you can, and they love Toy Story, great. So then you can do that. Now, if this was an emergent reader, I would be doing this. I would be doing C because that's one of the very first words. Toys, a piece of cake. He's going to learn that really fast because it's a high interest word. All right. I think, okay. So are there any questions about modifying trade books? Just unmute yourself and talk. Okay. And the directions, like I said, are in my book, Whole Child Reading. All right, let's talk about phonics. <clears throat> and I bet you're going to have some questions about this. All right. Um, let me see. Hold on a second. Uh, messing with my... Ah, good. Okay. <clears throat> phonics. There are two kinds of phonics. There's analytic phonics, meaning from the meaningful whole word is taught first, then we break it into parts. Now, please understand, before you do anything with phonics, you are teaching letter sounds. You're teaching them right out of the starting gate along with whole words. Letter sounds plus whole words. You do that from the very beginning. Uh, someone asked me once, uh, do, you have, do they have to learn all the sounds before you teach them whole words? No, 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 no. You just start them both together. All right, analytic phonics, yes, recommended. Synthetic phonics is from meaningless parts, diphthongs, blends, digraphs, etc. And later, those are assembled into words, not necessarily meaningful words, no, but they're assembled into words. I, those, that is not recommended for Down syndrome, and I'll explain why. All right. So <clears throat> phonics fist fight. Now this has been going on. <laughs> you know, you're going to get opposition probably if you try to, uh, you know, incorporate this in any way, try to bring the school along. Although if your school orders my reading program, I train them for an hour for free. And I mentioned that last time. Phonics fist fight. Let's go along with that alliteration there. All right, debate history. I actually researched this because I thought, how long has this been going on? Well, four centuries, <laughs> four centuries back and forth since the mid 1600s, believe it or not. All right, now, so let's look at the, the data. Many studies have been done on both sides of the argument and they took turns being prominent over maybe groups of 30 to 50 years or so. Oh, you know, whole word reading doesn't work. Let's do phonics. Uh, that's not working so well. Let's go back to whole word reading. Uh, that's not working so well. Back and forth. I kid you not. And each time phonics returned, they did it a little differently because it didn't quite work the time before. I, both sides have good research to back up their view. So what are we going to do? <clears throat> Let's consider the learning weaknesses in Down syndrome when we choose an approach. All we care about is how our kids most easily learn to read. I don't care what the accepted method is in a school. If it's not working for my child, I'm out of here with that. All right, here we go. What learning weaknesses am I talking about? And why do we teach meaningful words first and then analytic phonics, not synthetic? All right. Our learners with DS typically have difficulty discriminating sounds, poor short-term memory, poor auditory memory, fluctuating hearing loss, deficits in auditory processing, which impact their phonological awareness. It's not only poor auditory memory, it's short auditory memory. And I think I talked last time about teaching the, the, the letter W. If I say to a child with Down syndrome, this is W, W, what is that? You're likely to get the answer, that's U, because that's what I heard you say, W, U. I heard the last thing you said. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to use analytic phonics. And this is how it works. From the meaningful whole to the part. 
High interest words are learned first, then they're broken down into parts. Decoding ability grows with experience, even if you never go near synthetic phonics. That all depends on the child. There are a handful of our kids with Down syndrome who can learn synthetic phonics. They, they are less impeded by whether it's short auditory memory or phonological awareness problems or whatever. But the vast majority are not. They're gonna be so frustrated. With my own son, he had no patience in life, whatever. He was born without the patience gene, as well as an extra 21st. And so I didn't even go there. I just taught him letter sounds and personal book after personal book after personal book. And like I told you last time, he was an independent reader by about eight and a half. And we started when he was four and a half. And he just got to be such an experienced reader. He, he had figured out decoding. All right, yes, we use that. Banana, for example, maybe the child is crazy about bananas. You've made a personal book about bananas. She can read banana anywhere, anytime she sees it. So then you break it down. She knows her letter sounds, right? So then you help her understand how this works, how this gets broken down. All right, the phonics system typically used instead in schools is synthetic phonics. What that means is meaningless part to the whole, blends, digress, diphthongs, etc. Like, ch, ch, I'm gonna teach you that. Well, I could care less. I'm a kid with Down syndrome who's seven years old. Excuse me, that doesn't mean anything to me. How am I gonna retain that? Another problem is that, um, I love this quote from Glenn Dolman. Reading is a brain function. Phonics, spelling is a set of rules. And if we're going to expect our kids to remember sets of rules about phonics, well, good luck. It's just so much less painful to go with analytic phonics. Okay, so those parts are later assembled into words. It requires working memory and cognitive ability frequently beyond the grasp of learners with Down syndrome, not to mention auditory difficulties. Please don't use it unless your child is extraordinarily skilled at learning rules. All right, any, any questions before I go into comprehension? All right, and we, you know, you can use the, do use the chat box for, let me see where that is. Um, do use the chat box for questions. Okay, and we'll, we'll Krista, we're gonna have questions at the end. Comprehension. All right, there are two kinds. We start with the easy kind, referential comprehension. That means they can refer back to what they just read and find the answer. So we teach them how to do that first. Inferential comprehension means they've got to put, they've got to think. They have to put these abstract cons facts all together into the sort of abstract understanding. Oh, I get it. If A and B do C, then, you know, then D is going to happen. But that is about teaching thinking. All right, we do that later. Now, keep in mind, there's no comprehension without fluency and speed. So if a child has to really pause a long time at every word, their comprehension is not going to be so great. Now, um, I've had some parents who get, let's say the child is reading and they want the child to, to really get the primer level because they've accomplished the pre-primer level or the emergent level, but yet they will get my books from the earlier level because of fluency. The child can read it and can read it comfortably. So then they practice this fluency. They get the idea that, oh, I can read faster. I don't have to pause between every word. So we have to work on several things at once. All right, this is, I'm waving this flag forever. When a child learns to read for meaning. In other words, he thinks the only reason you're putting this thing in front of him is so he can find out what's in it. Then comprehension follows much more easily because that's why he's reading. And just a little story, when Jonathan was nine, I, I raised him in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, when he was nine, you know, every three years, you know how your child has to have a test to make sure the Down syndrome didn't go away, right? They just had to make sure about that so that he still gets services that just drove me crazy. Anyway, every three years. So this lady actually came to our home to evaluate him. 
So, and she handed him a sheet of paper and she said, read that story out loud. Because I told her he can read. So he read the story. And then she started firing these questions at him, these comprehension questions. Uh, it was about a little boy, a little boy's puppy got into the water and the puppy was going to drown or something like that. So the little boy put his boots on and he waded into the, the puddle and he got the puppy and saved the puppy and all that. Well, Jonathan is terrified of puppies and he doesn't like anything on his feet. So the boots and the puppy, zero interest. But I had raised him to think that he was reading only to find out what was in the story. So this woman started firing questions at him and I froze. I thought, I've never in my life asked him a comprehension question because he could read all these books that had no pictures. And so I just froze and sat there and he just answered question after question after question. I thought, oh, phew, thank God. Because even though it was low interest for him, he thought reading for meaning. I hope I made my point. <laughs> all right. Is it normal for my child's comprehension level to lag behind his reading level? Yes, you bet. Maybe by three grades. For instance, when Jonathan was last evaluated, when he was, he was evaluated in middle school, I think it was, and he was reading at a seventh grade level, but his comprehension was about at the fourth grade level, which I'm okay with because the report is that newspapers are typically written at about a fourth grade level, so I was okay with that. But it's normal for it to lag behind. So, whoops, now I'm off my screen again. What should I do? You keep working at it. You just keep working at it. You start with inferential comprehension and then you go referential, then you go to inferential. I want to recommend a book. You can get this on Amazon. Strategies that work three just means the third edition. This was uh, Harvey and Goodwitz wrote this. It's huge. It's a, big, it's a tome. It's just a reference book. And there are more comprehension ideas in there than you could do in a lifetime. Now, the interesting thing is that this is written for typical students, typically developing students. And yet, you know what it starts out with? It just blew me away. You have to use high interest materials and make it short. And I thought, okay, you know, absolutely. Same rules apply. All right, and this is my favorite quote from them, teaching reading comprehension, and they're talking about inferential. Teaching reading comprehension is mostly about teaching thinking. That takes time. We do it little by little by little. But here's some tips from the book. And I think the book costs about 30 bucks, something like that, because it's huge. Uh, tips from the book, use short, high interest text teach active rather than passive reading and they they claim that even using a highlighter in the book for example is still passive you need to be more interactive than that for comprehension so here's some other suggestions sticky notes and you can do this as you're you know for more advanced uh readers or they're having to deal with classroom material so one little paragraph read one paragraph what happened like huh i don't understand that write a question mark and on a sticky note and slap it on the paragraph or this is cool, you know, slap it on there. What I want to remember, slap it on there. So you've got, you're, you're making the, the printed page become very active. And then you can go back later and work on those. All right, you can put sticky notes on a clipboard to sequence the actions or the content, right? Now here's one that I really, really like that I use all the time with the kids. The student reads the sentence aloud twice, first time slow, second time he's actually a little faster. Then once again, silently to herself. Oh, wait, wait, that's, that's Sue Buckley. Okay, mine is different. Let me go back to that. Uh, th this is from Sue Buckley in Down Syndrome Education International. I forgot to put my sentence in there. What I have him do is read it twice through and then the third time I read with them, I'm a nanosecond ahead of them. So I'm pulling them along. It's like the wind beneath your wings. And for my students, it's the first time they've ever read at that speed. They're still reading, but I'm just a hair ahead of them. And that pulls them along. Uh, for teenagers, um, I had a teen student who loved to, to be timed 
because he wanted to beat his time. Now I kept my timer underneath the table so it wouldn't distract him, but he wanted to know, and he could get down to half time. He could get that, he could improve that much, which of course, as a 15 year old, you know, was totally cool. All right. Early training, use several color highlights to code the questions and the answers. Later, eliminate those colors. And I think I showed you last week, um, the interior, or maybe I didn't, maybe I have it in this slide. I kind of get my, my webinars confused here if I'm giving <laughs> several in a week. All right. Now I want to give you tips for Down syndrome. Now, these are really crucial. These are crucial. Comprehension questions, avoid compound sentences when possible. Don't confuse the issue. Place the crucial part of the question at the end of the sentence. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Rephrase the questions to match the cognitive ability of the child. Um, do you remember Emily? I'm trying to remember her last name. She was one of the founders of Sesame Street. And she wrote, she wrote a book. And she's the one that came up with the, the phrase, welcome to Holland. She wrote that essay. You think you're going to Italy and you wind up in Holland because your child has Down syndrome. All right, well, I saw her years, decades ago, being interviewed on TV with her son with Down syndrome. He was about 10, nine or 10. And the interview, she, Emily's sitting next to her son and the interviewer asks her son a question. Her son just looks, you know, and he's a smart kid, but he just looks and doesn't say a word. Emily sitting next to him rephrased the question. Instantly, the kid answered. So that's what I'm talking about. You know what, how your child best understands questions. And if you can help the teacher, his educator understand that as well, that would be very helpful. All right, use visuals whenever possible. Okay, now I'm gonna show you about putting the crucial part of the question at the end of the sentence. And why would I do that? Short auditory memory. I'm gonna remember what you said last. Okay, let's look at that. Here's some examples. You backload the sentences to help with WH questions, which are so confusing, right? Who? The boy eating pizza is Jeremy. Who is eating pizza? Jeremy. What? Jeremy is eating pizza. What is Jeremy eating? Pizza. Where? Jeremy is eating pizza at the table. Where is he eating? At the table. When? Jeremy will eat pizza after school. When will he eat pizza? After school. Okay, we're setting them up. And of course, this is step one. Are we always gonna do this? No, but we are teaching them. You can answer that question from what I just said. You can go back and look at what I just said and you can give me the right answer. Okay, any questions about that? Or we can just have questions at the end. All right, set up for success. All right, this is great. <laughs> Emily and George live in Sweden and she has hired me twice to give her a personal consult from Sweden. <laughs> I've done it in Ireland too and these you know, amazing places uh, because that's something I offer on my site that parents can purchase. All right, so she did it by the book. She said, I followed your directions exactly. Do you see that there's nothing on the wall? There's nothing on the table. There's nothing anywhere. And there's certainly no radio going on or other kids running around screaming or whatever. So, and this little kid, George, is a great reader. He's been doing this now, I guess it's three years, I think. And uh, so I want you, and that's a personal book. Now, does this look familiar? You remember how Anne, little Anna's personal book look? I'm gonna zero in on this. All right, you see, it's just like the book you saw last week from Anne, except that this is in Swedish and I can't read it. <laughs> All right, um, but she, the model is exactly the same. She did exactly what I say to do in the book. All right, use a pointer. This is my off-season collection of pointers. Then I have a Christmas selection, you know, a Halloween selection, yada, yada, football, etc. And I always let the child choose and let them choose one for me too, because that gives, makes them even more of the boss, right? Now, 
why use a pointer? Why not use your finger? <laughs> or let the child use a finger? I'll tell you why. <clears throat> so it's a visual, of course, it's a visual extension of the brain's focus. You wanna know where the child is. You'll know if they're following correctly or if they're on the wrong word. You're using your pointer and you're going along, all right? You can guide them to the exact word. Now, if they get off and they're, you're over here and they're still on this one, it's so easy to just pick. You don't say, no, no, no. You just pick up the eraser and put it over in the right spot. It's, it's easy peasy. And it keeps them correctly distanced from the book so they're not nose to paper, which can become a habit really fast. And it's impersonal. You don't have your finger in their face. I don't like fingers on my face. I'm sure they don't either. All right, so here's an example. So if we don't, it helps to establish the correct distance. So we don't want to do that. We don't want that to become a habit. We would rather have this. Other challenges. What about ASD? What if they're on the spectrum as well as Down syndrome? What about ADHD, whether without the H or not, the hyperactivity or not, ADD or ADHD? And what about CAS, apraxia, childhood apraxia of speech? What if those diagnoses are involved as well? And let me just tell you off the bat that the probability, depending on how many people we have attending, the probability is that there is a percentage of families that have a child with one of these secondary diagnoses and you're just unaware of it. And so you're not getting the services you could be getting. And there are reasons why you might not be aware of it. <clears throat> and I'll go into that. Oh, and just to back up, my son has three. He has Down syndrome, he has severe ADHD and he has ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, which we finally, when he was seven, you know, we had so many destruction builds to our home that we finally took him in. Uh, I have a, my sister's son had hyper, severe hyperactivity, so I, I knew what it looked like. Anyway, I took him, we took him into Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, which had a Down syndrome clinic, which was headed by a fabulous pediatrician who could look at a child and see Down syndrome, Down syndrome and ADHD, Down syndrome and autism. She was just so skilled. She used to be a national speaker who would go around to all the conferences and now she's retired. But we were just lucky that we lived in the city where she lived, you know. So ASD or autism, anywhere on the spectrum, anywhere. Attention deficit, a deficit disorder with or without the hyperactivity and then childhood apraxia of speech. That's what I'm talking about because those are the most common. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna go into this a little bit. And, and part of when I'm giving tips for teaching a child with a dual diagnosis of DSASD, it also applies to any kid who can't focus. All right, anybody. So this kind of across the board, I think it's useful just to go over this with you. We teach to the autism. If there's an actual diagnosis, you're sure about it. We teach to the autism because autism trumps Down syndrome. And I'd been saying that for years. And then <clears throat> I read information from the C-Center in Colorado, which I'll get to, where the head doctor said, autism trumps Down syndrome. All right, this is it. The C-Center for Down syndrome, it's at Children's Hospital in Colorado. So if you wanna find it, you go to, they do, they're, they're astonishing. They're like the gold standard, awesome resource for, children who have Down syndrome and autism, if you can afford it, if you can afford to go there. So go to that website, childrenscolorado.org, then search for C-Center and that's how you get there. Otherwise it's kind of hard to find it. All right, uh, the doctor who founded the C-Center, uh, which is the Center for Down syndrome and autism, his son who is now I think in his twenties has that dual diagnosis. And he says it's profoundly underdiagnosed by medical doctors. And he's a doctor, he's a physician. Now I'm gonna tell you why it's underdiagnosed. And Sandra, you know, since you're the expert with the what, is he, how old is, he's 18? 22. Boom, my gosh, I'm behind the time. Almost 23. <laughs> okay, okay, so Sandra, I want you to weigh in at the end on this, okay? Uh, tell me what I forgot, <clears throat> but. <laughs> Underdiagnosed for a variety of reasons. Number one, 
doctors may not have the exper expertise, the experience to diagnose accurately. And here's a phrase I hate. Oh, it's just Down syndrome, we expect that. Oh my God, it drives me nuts, all right? Parents second, parents may be afraid of the child having another label. And I can understand that, that's not fun. But you want services. All you're doing is making your life easier. If there indeed is another diagnosis and you got a label for it and then you can go to bat for getting the services and you can talk to your regional center and to whomever Sandra tells you to talk to because she's the resource. All right, also schools may not wanna have that extra diagnosis in there. Oh my God, they're gonna to have to give extra services. That's gonna cost them more money. So there are reasons why these diagnoses may not happen. All right, but I want you to understand some of the needs of our learners with ASD or ADHD. Okay, when Jonathan had just been diagnosed like the week before, <laughs> It was Christmas time and I took him and his little five and a half year old sister to the Cincinnati Zoo, to the festival of a million lights. <laughs> so I pull into the parking, of course, husband is out of town, I'm by myself. I pull into the parking lot and there is the choo-choo train going and there are the Christmas carols going and there are the million lights going. Sandra, I can see you're really catching on to this. Million lights going and my son, start screaming at the top of his lungs and covering his ears. I thought, oh my God, what's going on here? So what could I do? I had to leave the parking lot. I couldn't, at which point my daughter started screaming her head off, right? Cause she wanted to go to the festival. The next morning, bright and early, I called the pediatricians at the Down syndrome center. I said, what was that? And the pediatrician explained it beautifully. He said, all of us, so we have all these dials, okay, sight, all of our senses. All right, if we're reading a book, for example, I'm gonna choose that. So let's say we're reading a book. So our sight is fully turned up, all right? Uh, smell, eh, that's gone, touch, no, we're not paying attention to that. All of those dials are turned way down. Hearing, eh, that's turned down a little bit. We're still, we can still hear, but you know, the clock can chime in the hallway and you're not gonna hear it if you're engrossed in a book, right? All right, what happens to a learner with autism or, down, or ADHD? Here's what happens. The pediatrician explained, he said, all of the dials are turned up to 10,000. There's no regulation. There's no ability to turn all these other things down. That's why when I get a kid in my office, and there's a little bit of a light somewhere and if there are a million things in front of him, he's just focused on that, right? Because it's so distracting. All right, so here's what happens. You turn up sight all the way, turn up hearing all the way, smell, touch, taste. You're on total overwhelm, overwhelm. All right, so here's some little focusing aids, even if they don't have any of these diagnoses. <clears throat> Number one, covering up everything except the one sentence you're asking that child to read. Another way, another uh, disability or challenge that this helps with is visual problems, you know, tracking problems, narrow it down. So, and I had uh, at the DSALA, I had one student, a girl who had the dual diagnosis of autism, which is a little more unusual, more, usually it's the guys. Uh, she was about 11 and she came in and so I'm teaching her and she can't focus. She can't just put her eyes on that one. So I got out my two laminated blank pages, right? And I started to cover the other ones. Oh, she had a fit. And I said, just, just let's try it once. So I did that. And after that, she never would agree to read without the two pages there because it made her life easier. So another idea is, Hi there, Caroline's son, <laughs> Caroline. Um, all right, so another is the flashlight pen. This is great. Turn off the lights, turn off the lights. Let them have control over that. And I have a flashlight pen too. And if they get off, you know, I can redirect them. And then lastly, using very, very, very soft classical music of a very 
calm and kind. Not all classical music is calm. Not all Mozart is calm, but a lot of it can be and help regulate the brain. But it has to be super soft. Use soft incandescent lighting, no fluorescent lighting. A lot of studies have been done about the bad effects of fluorescent lighting <clears throat> on children and learning. My sister, when she was in high school, passed out once just from doing ballet under fluorescent lighting because she was hypersensitive. <clears throat> All right, and you can reduce the visual field. This is another student at the DSALA who had significant trouble focusing, and yet there was a blank corner of the room, and when I put this piece of paper, her personal page, up there, made all the difference in the world. She went right to it and started pointing and trying to read what was on the wall because there were no other, <laughs> there were no other options. <laughs> Completely reduced the visual field. All right. <clears throat> and I, she was not the only student I did that with. You just tape it to the wall. Okay. <clears throat> Talking about apraxia, I won't talk about this much. Let's do it really fast since we're just about out of time. But approximately the 20 to 30% of our kids with DS are somewhere on the apraxia spectrum. This is data, okay? And here's again what I hate to hear. Oh, it's just Down syndrome, we expect that. No, no, she doesn't have a, a speech uh, diagnosis. It's just a developmental delay. Well, 20 to 30% of the time, it's not. It's not. All right, it's not a developmental delay. It's something quite different. It's a motor disorder, and it involves the coordination of the brain and the speech muscles. And I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm talking about. And it needs specialized therapy. Your typical speech therapy is not gonna do the trick. You need to go to an SLP who specializes in apraxia, period. And you also need to go probably to that, that specialist to get it diagnosed in the first place. Down syndrome speech delay, developmental delay, is not a medical diagnosis and is not going to get you any services. <clears throat> CAS is a medical diagnosis and should get you services. All right. <clears throat> Here's a recommended resource. I think you have to join the NACD to get these, but there are <clears throat> actually online, there are a lot of now apraxia. It's, there's a lot of apraxia help. And if you're on Facebook and you join the apraxia groups, there's DS and apraxia groups, communication and Down syndrome, there are a number of groups, parent groups, just join them. You get all kinds of resources. All right, so I said we teach reading for meaning. I'm sorry we got started so late. We got started 15 minutes late. I'm gonna keep going. I hope you can stay. I said we teach reading for meaning. Is there a secondary reason? Is there a secondary goal? You betcha. We teach reading for meaning. We teach, re excuse me, we teach reading to teach talking. We teach reading to teach talking. All right, I'm gonna give you an example of a developmental speech delay due to Down syndrome. <clears throat> the first video on the left is when this little girl first came in to start her reading lessons with me. Now listen to what she does. She's doing, I talk to her, She's just echoing what I said. She's just doing echolalia. She's hardly moving her lips. This is a Down syndrome speech delay. All right. So Emily, what did you do in school today? Emily's school. Emily's school. What did you do in school today? What? Yeah. Huh? Good. Yeah. Oh, you did good. Yeah. Well, what did? All right. Okay. So this is it. This is her two years later. She just had a speech, a developmental speech delay, or what I call my, my latest uh, video that I put up on Facebook and YouTube last week, TMT syndrome, too much trouble. It's too much trouble. That was one of my son's favorite phrases. Too much trouble. <laughs> no matter what it was, too much trouble. Okay, this is our two years later of having a reading lesson every week due to her faithful grandma who brought her every week. Here we go. Shall I? Okay. Look. Is. So you Right here. Is. Me. What is this? 
Three. Good job. Me. Play. Very good. I play in shop. Good job. Me. Mm, what is mm. that? Mom. <laughs> My. Good job. Okay. <laughs> Pretty incredible when you look at her <laughs> two years before that. Okay, now, <clears throat> now I'm going to demonstrate. This is a, an, a really bright little guy, but with severe apraxia. And this is him after his mom and his auntie, who is an SLP, worked like crazy for like two years trying to help this motor disorder. <clears throat> I want you to watch his mouth. I want you to watch his difficulty with forming it because it's a mus muscle to brain problem. It's entirely different than too much trouble syndrome, okay? Oh, no. Good job. Good job. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> you see how hard he's working. And for him, the word is, is G. <clears throat> That's fine. One of the things that, uh, that I say is, I accept any consistent sound. I know he's reading that word, and for him, that's is. <clears throat> so I hope that makes it clear, the difference. All right. <clears throat> and this is in my book. You have ways of testing children who are nonverbal, and you have ways of the nonverbal proving on the right side here. That's for the classroom. You know, it makes a huge difference. Uh, I had one little student, um, sharp as a tack, uh, severe apraxia, basically just mm was her sound. And so the school makes a very, very bad assumption that she's not smart and they treat her that way. And her mother is sitting there saying, she reads, she reads, she knows a thousand signs. Now the teachers didn't know signs, but <clears throat> so anyway, so I, uh, I came up with this. So you had take a video of the child signing whatever word she's gonna be reading. Then you take a video of her reading the book by signing. And then you, uh, and you can also do a video of her building sentences, which I'll show you in a second. And then you take that and send that to the teacher and make sure the teacher views the video. And so this mom did that, she was a power mom. She did that and it totally changed the teacher's attitude. Oh, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, this kid is smart. She reads, she can't speak. So maybe the, te maybe the classroom aide or teacher needs to learn some sign language. I don't know. All right. I think she also had an, uh, you know, assistive communication device. All right. So <clears throat> this is an idea for how to help a child who's nonverbal or limited verbally to build a sentence. Now I find, I used to use these and I find that for some kids, the fine motor is just, it's just too difficult. So instead I'll use a, a just a big strip of red paper, red because that's very attractive. All right, so here's the child I was talking about whose mom took a video in. This is how we worked this. Another way we can build sentences. Elizabeth <laughs> is gonna build a sentence. Elizabeth swims with Nemo and his friends. So and she's a really good sentence. reader. Here we go. So this is not hard for her. All right. All of them ready? Okay. Sorry about the camera right. work. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Elizabeth. Good job. 
swims. Mm -hmm. Good job. With, with. Where's with? Good. So the words are scrambled. The words are completely Good. scrambled. Nemo. <laughs> mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. his, his friends. Good job, Elizabeth. Good job. So let's read. Elizabeth swims. Good for signing with Nemo. Mm -hmm. And his friends. Very good, Elizabeth. Awesome. Okay, now a video of that would totally convince the teachers, right? <clears throat> okay. So we're at the end here. Your starting prescription is five minutes twice a day. I'm making sure you're going to read those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For those of you who looked away, you missed a show. <laughs> five minutes twice a day. All right. <clears throat> so let's see now. Okay. I'm going to stop my share. All right, so and I'm going to open the chat box so I can see what's going on. Oh, good. So someone did. Okay, Caroline. Yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, I'm glad he has a, a dual diagnosis of DS and ASD. Good. I hope some of this is helpful. And in my book, I have a chapter on that, a chapter that deals with ASD and apraxia together. Okay, somebody asked, what was the difference between referential and inferential comprehension? Referential refer. Can you can refer back to the text and the answer is right there. Inferential, the answer is not there. You have to put together a few bits of information that you read about and then come up with the answer. All right. Hi, uh, would I be able to ask a question aloud or are you absolutely, going through the Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in learning more about synthetic phonics. Uh, because I feel I, I'm a special education teacher and I feel like all I know is analytic phonics. So this was a light bulb moment for me. And so um, I was wondering if you recommend any specific program for uh, explicit synthetic instruction. Okay, I think you're, are you confusing the two? Synthetic is what is taught in schools and that's the meaningless parts. But analytic okay. is whole word and then broken down. Which is it that oh. you Okay, yeah, I was flip-flopping them. So I right. thought analytic was you analyze first and then you read whole word, but okay, so. Yeah, well, um, you're analyzing the whole word. Okay. Got it. Synthetic, okay. those are synthetic parts. They're not, that's not words. So that's synthetic, okay. yeah. Gotcha, uh, uh-huh. If I were you, I, I don't have a specific, specific resource. So if I were you, I would just Google it and see what you can find. Uh, you know, the difference between the two and what the approaches are. But basically, analytic is you start with meaningful whole words. And you're teaching that and learning in a, a way that, for instance, last week, I stressed reading for meaning and how, how we go about doing that. So that's the whole basis. You have to start there and then you take those words because the, the learner is already learning the letter sounds and then you show them how that, how that works. We, were, were you here last week? I was, yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, so you have much. the printout from last week as well. The, the PDF got, got emailed to you. So be sure to look at that because even though the whole thing wasn't recorded, the whole PDF is there. Mm hmm right okay perfect yeah um, I'll do that. yeah bravo for being open to trying this because it is the easier way for our kids to learn to decode right and and i've worked with students with different types of disabilities um specifically learning disabilities but my husband and i are having a child with down syndrome and i don't have a lot of experience with that so i feel like you struck a chord when you said you know we want to teach the way they're going to learn so whatever's the most intriguing, uh, especially when they're younger and have shorter attention spans and the most effective is the way right. we have to teach. So I'm definitely open-minded to this. Good, and get my um, book, Whole Child Reading, because yeah. I, you'll learn so much from that. 
it's just from from ground zero all the way through how our kids most easily learn to read it's thank you whole, whole child reading you can get it on amazon or my site either one all right thank you thank you so much okay uh, all right, let's see. Uh, when do we want to do match select name? Is that part of everyday practice? It can be if you feel the child is ready for it, but you don't make it a part of fun, which is re teaching reading. You make that you work that at a separate time, just like you would work articulation at a separate time. Um, if you feel like the child is eager, ready to go, then you can do it within the same uh, the same period, the same session but just separate it a bit so that he doesn't associate testing with the fun, the fun activity of learning to read about things he just loves. Is that clear? All right. And you are gonna start with match first, then go to select that name. All right, do I have a brochure or flyer that you can share with educators and schools about my program? No, but I have an extremely well-developed website. So it's specialreads.com and it's loaded with Educator testimonials, parent testimonials, you can look inside the pages of the books. It's, it's very well developed. So I would recommend that. Another thing they can do is go to my YouTube channel, but that's not going to give them the printed information they need. Okay, what is active reading versus passive reading? Uh, <clears throat> well, the, the book I recommended, Strategies That Work, that'll go into that quite a bit. But basically, passive reading, I'm just reading the book and maybe I'm using a highlighter. Active reading, I'm writing in the margins of putting the post-its on and saying, I don't understand this, question mark. Slap it on the page. In other words, you're interacting with the material on the page in some way. All right. <laughs> uh, I want to hear from Sandra if we don't have any more questions. Sandra? Would you like to add anything <clears throat> to anything that I've talked about, but especially the dual diagnosis? Uh, uh, when you told the story about going to this parking lot, it just brought me back to, um, you know, what I, I didn't know my son had uh, autism. Uh, I had been fighting to get the speech therapy and finally, um, you know, we start going to this uh, non-public agency. Um, right here on my house on Ventura Boulevard. And so we would park and then go. <laughs> and like about the third time, um, um, we just parked. I mean, the only thing we did was park, you know, and my son started throwing a fit. And I couldn't understand why, and I couldn't even make him go. Uh, and so it's, it happened a couple of times, but uh, so, I, so then I was like, you know, this is, yeah, it, it looked more like um, autism because I have friends that have kids with autism. So then I started comparing, you know, he does more things like this kids than kids with just Down syndrome. And um, so I reached out to the regional center for an assessment and everything. And they did an assessment. And one of the issues was um, because they, they get stuck on uh, routines. So then uh, the issue was that I didn't park in the same spot. Oh, God. <laughs> and Whoa. he was having a fit because I didn't park in the same spot. So. Oh, my gosh. And for you to figure that out. Uh. Yeah. And uh, so we started, they started working with me more than with my son. Of course, <laughs> That's right. I'm also, I'm also full of routines and everything. So um, I had to get used to not parking even in the same parking lot. I had to go park on the street, park one block down. It, you know, a surprise would get chicken nuggets. So we, you know, there was a McDonald's right there, but sometimes we would go to a different uh, McDonald's or get pizza. So I, we had to start changing even the way I drove home. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so we had to get him out of those, you know, routines because that's what made him so um, strict. Uh you know, yeah. routines and stuff. That helped quite a bit, but I didn't know all of this. And um, when I started getting services, I was, uh, in a way, when I forced the, uh, and you know, my son is almost 23 years old, but when I forced the diagnosis, because I didn't want to, 
uh, at that time, the regional center were not providing behavior services to children with Down syndrome, only to kids with autism. Oh. So I had to force him to give him a diagnosis. And then I was like, woohoo. But then it was like, oh, but, he has a but we got the help. And, uh, and he, he's actually doing really well. And about reading, it's, it's so true. Uh, and I, I wish I had access to your reading material since he was little because I struggled so much. And, uh, and then I, I think I went to your, one of your conferences somewhere in national, because I went to a lot of National Down Syndrome Congress conferences oh, yeah, yeah. and stuff. And so I started doing the flashcards and, but I didn't uh, do the high interest stuff because, you know, that, I guess from just conference, I didn't get all that. But uh, years later, uh, you know, we had to work through all these behaviors and stuff like that. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, it was just wonderful um, to see the changes in my son. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, well, it, he's amazing. It was, he's amazing. He's, he's better behaved than Jonathan is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I enjoy my son, you know, like he yeah. came, you know, because I know from the beginning it was rough, you know, and and there came the time when I really enjoyed my son and he enjoyed his life. And um, then he, we started seeing more of, more of his personality come out and uh, his, the things that he enjoys, his, you know. And then all of a sudden he starts reading things that he enjoys. Um, he, yep. If, you know, he, he, he's everything. He would have been a doctor, a soldier, a movie director. He, I mean, he's everything, you know, he has, so many interests. Uh, yeah. So many interests, but um, in um, reading, he started, he loves karaoke, and so he would just Google, you know, I mean, it's just amazing, you know, and started typing things and his favorite songs, and and all of a sudden, he's, I mean, even writing, I, like I said, I struggled with writing, reading, all this stuff, and me trying, you know, this kid that couldn't sit for a second, I was chasing him, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so then behavior therapy happened and it really helped. And uh, then he started actually writing uh, those little uh, cards. What do you call those little? Uh, we got a bunch of those little cards and he's just started writing the lyrics to songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his yeah. writing was just, I'm like, wow, he's, <laughs> and, uh, and then he started, he just starts reading the words and, um, he is obsessed with different things like bones and the, you know, the, the human body. So he can read even uh, difficult words, uh, yeah. parts of the body, bones and things. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. anyway. and that, and that, you know, it's about reading for meaning and it's about things that they are interested in. And something you said <clears throat> made me think of a tip that I want to give people. Um, <clears throat> you talked about routine and how you had to break it up for others of course it helps to have a routine and i i almost never forgave jonathan's teacher in uh i guess it was late grade school for teaching him the word schedule because i'd tell him to do something and he'd say it's not in my schedule you know it's like this so but schedule is what i used for him because on weekends he just wanted to play his drums in his room and that's it you know, if I opened his door or knocked on his door and opened it and said, okay, now you got to do chores. It was, oh my God. So I printed out, and since he could read, I made a schedule. All right. And I made two copies. I kept one and I kept, he had the other. Now there was no time on it, but there was an order. So I would, I would say in big, bold black letters, play in your room. And then I would have sort the laundry, play in your room sort the recycling, play, play in your room, so that he would look, and I posted, I taped it to the wall above his drum set. <laughs> so, so then, what, after I did that, if they, could, if they know that's coming, that they will have, they can play, awesome, you know, I, I emphasize that part of it, but, oh, then I'm gonna have to do that, but then I'm gonna play again. I never had trouble after that. I'd knock on the door, I'd open the door and he'd go, oh, all right. And then he'd get up and do it. So uh, there's a, years and years and years ago, 
in Disabilities Solutions, that newsletter, there was an article called, I See What You Mean. And I loved that article. I saved it and I operated on that. I made, you make things, especially for kids with autism, but also Down syndrome, make it visual, make it visual, whatever has to happen. I mean, to this day in Jonathan's bathroom, there is a sign hanging, how to wipe your poop, you know, <laughs> step one, two, three, four, you know, um, <laughs> because it has to be done correctly, right? Um, but anyway, it was written by Patty McVeigh and a couple of other people. Some of you may know her as a national speaker. And I never dreamed that years later, I would get to know her. She, become, she would become a friend. We would be speaking at conferences together and that she would write the inclusion chapter in my book. Uh, what is it? Down syndrome, uh, Down syndrome Parenting 101. So I had no idea that I'd ever have a connection with this woman, but I see what you mean. It's just, it's very powerful. Okay, <clears throat> when can we expect that our children will be able to write expressively as well? Is there something in your program that works on this? No, I don't, I don't do writing. I don't work uh, in that direction. I can recommend a couple of things. One is for handwriting, definitely handwriting without tears. Uh, Jan Olson's the founder. She's changed that to learning without tears, but you just go to, you go to her site, both, both sites work, they'll bring you to the same place. If you will type hwtears.com, that'll get you there, hwtears.com. Her method of handwriting, you can just do uppercase printing if that's all you can do, and that's what Jonathan does because his fine motor is very, very poor. But he learned to write using Jen's program. It's fantastic for our kids, it's very adaptable for our kids. And the second thing I'd recommend is that you, from Down Syndrome Education International USA, there's a, you know, in, in Southern California, there's a, a branch. Um, and I can't remember exactly what their, their uh, web address is, but it's Down Syndrome Educational International, but it's Down Syndrome Education USA. So the DSA, Interna I mean, International produced a series of books on writing and reading. I would recommend you get those. And you can put those two together because they have fabulous success over there. Of course, they're only highlighting their very, very high functioning students, right? They used to have a school before the recession hit in whatever year that was. They had really good funding and they had their school and I was talking to Sue Buckley's son, Frank Buckley, a couple of national conferences ago, and he said they lost the funding. They had to close their school. So they're like everybody else doing everything online. <clears throat> Any other questions? Just unmute yourself. Victoria. So um, you gave us a lot of great, you know, tools here. And so I'm going to I, this week, I religiously stuck to having him read his personal pages, those five minutes twice a day. But then now you've, you know, given us now these other things like the, the lotto game and the match select name, and then also the personal books. So I'm, I'm sure in your program, you probably have like the whole. Well, there are lots of choices. Yeah, right. How, how do we like, like. So today I'm going to stick to just reading the personal pages or, and then maybe later on we'll have a little session where we do the, the lotto game and the personal books or like, how do you find that you can make this work for a person, a parent with their child um, right. during the day or during the week? Right. Uh, first of all, if you think he can sit, is it a, a boy, your son? Yes. Okay. If you think he can sit for 10 minutes twice a day, I would do that. It's not limited to five. It's like, that's where you start if you can't do any more. Okay. All right. All right. And so I think last time that I talk about shuffling like a deck of cards, you put in all these different, did I not do that? Talk about that. Um, uh, think of keeping things fresh. You still have to repeat the material that hasn't been learned yet, but we walk up, we walk a razor's edge between either repeating the same old material and boring them and losing them or going too fast with too much new material and losing them because we discourage them. So shake it up. 
if he if he's done a personal page for a whole week don't don't keep going with that make a new personal page how many personal pages did you do and did you do you, i'd like to see them uh, so we only did one personal page um actually it turned into like a couple pages because i i did the writing so big all right now what level is he um well he's he's in second grade and he There's... only recognizes a few sight words Okay. All right. So, his name. All right. so far. So what you're doing is pretty ambitious. Hold it up again. Hold it up again. Okay. My name is Luca. Is it backwards? Right. That I can read it fine. It's great. No, no, okay. no. It's great. Um, that is at a much higher level. So when you're starting with an emergent reader right out of the gate, you're going to repeat vocabulary like crazy. Are you familiar with the uh, Dick and Jane books from long ago? Okay. So my name is Luca. Mama's name is da da da. Daddy's name is da 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 da. Repetition, repetition. You want to teach him specific words and he'll do that by repetition. You've got enough material in that one personal page for uh six or seven or eight books <laughs> personal books that would just be based on you know a particular item of that hold that up again for example okay yeah in fact i would start my name is luca that's good um i would just became that's crazy i'm sorry those are just super advanced um you're go okay let's do it about play my name is Luca. I like to play. Mama's name, you, you can, even that's too much. Uh, I like to play. I play with my trains. I play with my da-da-da. I play with my da-da-da-da-da. Okay? And then build a whole book or a whole personal page on my family. I love my family. I love mama. I love papa. I love sister, wh whoever. You. So you're teaching, I love play and with even though with is from a higher word list and, and then those words i love play would be the fast flash words uh, as well as mama and daddy and papa or whatever i think everything in all that words. words that he doesn't know okay and so he, name, he knows his name and he knows i yeah, yeah. so i would include that you do you would not include those okay. right Right. So in that case, you can actually, um, if we're, if you're going to get that simple, if you're going to listen to what I'm saying and get that basic, you could do two or three uh, personal pages a week. That would be cool. And save them, you know, keep them in a binder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So does that help you understand? And everybody else who's listening, see, every time I get to look at what you've done, it teaches everybody else. It's awesome because you don't know. You haven't done these before. All right. But just think Dick and, Dick and Jane. See Dick run. See Jane run. Run, run, run. Run, Dick run. Run, Jane run. See Spot run. You know? I actually, I actually have the big giant book I bought years ago because it was more of a nostalgic thing for me. Yeah. When I open it, I just think, oh, my goodness. But I can see how that basic stuff that was how we learned. That's how my generation and the next generation or two learned. Absolutely. Repetition, repetition. We did not, when I was in kindergarten and first grade, phonics was out of style. You know how I talked about going back and forth, no phonics, bad news, bad phonics, bad, bad dog, <laughs> you know? So yeah, we learned by repetition and sight. And I think we're all pretty good readers. We all turned out to be okay. I, I read with the Dick and Jane books too. Did you as well? In kindergarten. And I, I was, I was, and I didn't, English wasn't my first language. Ah, yeah. And I went to kindergarten and they gave me those books and I learned how to read, just like you said, from sight. Okay, and now. Okay. So put your brain in Dick and Jane mode when you're designing these for your son. That's perfect. And you can do a bunch of them, you know, because it's so re repetitive. I actually use the Dick and Jane books in, uh, in, at, at the DSALA. I, I found uh, somewhere the larger, the version of them with the larger type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the reprints that you can find on Amazon, for some reason, they put the type small. Why would they do that? Duh. Yeah, so anyway. 
Okay. I wanted to say that um, uh, it was helpful that I uh, I bought a lot of cardstock to print my son's um, personal pages and those little flashcards. And then I also bought, um, and if you can see a little bunch of those. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of them. I still have a lot of those, you know. Yeah, 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 rings are great. <laughs> you know, and, and I just. And, and those rings are what I've been showing you, both on the lady in Sweden, the mom in Sweden, and the mom in Northern California. When I showed you the personal books, they were using Sandra's rings. <laughs> no. All right, somebody asks, uh, all right, I guess it's Carrie Lee. I was hoping to ask you a question at the end because my son is reading phonetically and you're talking about synthetic ph phonics, right? Yes, but if I kind of want to- If it's working, great, keep reading, keep using well, it. Well, what I wanted to ask is, so where he's having issues is um, like changing between word families, you know, so I have like these readers that are all like in the at word family or the am word family. But once you combine like all the different a word families, he's, you know, it's, he can't do them fluently and it's, it's really challenging. Would the fast flash method work for that? For word? For, well, you know, word? if I understand what you're talking about, you're actually talking, you're really sort of not talking about reading for meaning because they have forced those sentences. It's not an easy flow of on a topic that he loves, right? I mean, I would, I would never want to have to read cat, bat, mat, pat. I, I would go crazy if I were a little kid. So but I, that's just not, that's not meaningful to me. So when you're combining these different synthetic phonic approaches i don't know just do the best you can unless i can unless you can show me can you show me a book can you show me something so i know what you're talking about um so show me what's confusing him okay so i put my own label to make it bigger See, that would make me nuts there's nothing meaningful about that absolutely nothing pam had a bag the bag had jam oh my god i'm sorry I think that's just a recipe for confusion. Hmm. There's nothing meaningful about it. It makes no sense. We don't speak that way. We don't write that way. Why would we for that's just my that's my personal opinion. I would be confused, much less your son. Well, I kind of stopped this thing because I felt I like it was oh, once God. we you know it's got to this. Keep in mind it's meaningless. That is not the way you talk. That's not the, the, nothing you read is like that. We're teaching language, grammar, and reading for meaning. All right. And even though that's technically the correct grammar, it's meaningless. That's completely meaningless. I'm sorry. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. <laughs> All right. Somebody asked, I used to do hooked on phonics years ago with preschoolers. So not recommended for our little ones with DS, right? Do, if it works, use it. Just be sure you're teaching letter sounds right from the beginning, even before hooked on phonics, teach the letter sounds and teach whole meaningful whole words, high interest, meaningful whole words. Any other questions? I have one more. So how did your son get from like learning a certain set of words and then just being able to go on to other texts that you hadn't like taught, you know, like here you're teaching us the personal pages and flashing the words, but then how do they get from that to other texts? Do you get what I mean? Uh, because I never taught, I never created his personal books around a set of words. I never did that. I created personal books around his life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, my grandma gave me a train whistle. It goes da 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 all from his life. So I didn't work with word lists. I worked with his life list. So every book got more complex. Uh, the tab got smaller, more words on a page. So then there were paragraphs. Uh, and he was so jazzed about what I was writing about that he easily learned those words. And of course I had a million flashcards because every word that was new to him I made a flashcard for, and in the beginning, every single word was new to him. So mm -hmm. I taught him. It's a, it's an experience, experiential thing. Once they are experienced enough with reading a wide variety 
of Stephanie, for instance, he loves calliopes. Okay, so I pulled a bunch of uh, text from the Encyclopedia Britannica about calliopes. It's a type of organ. And, you know, put in lots of pictures and all of that. It's, if it's about his life, if it's meaningful, you're just going to expand like crazy. You don't even have to worry about word lists. Although I would in the beginning, for those, not you, but for those of, of you that I'm, you know, coaching through, I love mama, I love papa, etc. It If you're teaching reading for meaning, it's going to happen naturally. If you're not teaching for reading, uh, for meaning, if you're going by word lists or word families, then that's a different story. You'll just have to work harder. Mm -hmm. Because it's me. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the person who asked, Evelyn, I uh, used to do Hooked on Phonics. Do you have a follow-up question to that? You know, if it works, if you find it, it's effective. As I said, go ahead and use it, but do the letter sounds and the whole word reading from the beginning. I don't know if she's still here. Let's see. She's here. Yeah, okay, she's here. All right, any other questions? I'm sorry, I have one more. Um, if we have like flashcards from other programs that we've done that are in black, is that still helpful to fast flash those? Because it would be a lot of work to retype everything in for red. You, for you, from what you've told me about your son, both last week and this week, not a problem. Not a problem. Oh, okay. Use him. Use him. It's in the beginning because he's further along. He's much further along, so it's fine. Yeah, the good news is that once your child really gets started with this, then you can just buy the flashcards. You don't have to make them all. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you so much. You're welcome. So we're gonna. Uh, I just wanted to send show the PDFs, right? Oh, PDF okay. uh, presentation. Okay, Victoria. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's tiny. That is not how it was in the beginning. That's not how it was. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can find, um, hold on. And then it gets more complex. <laughs> it's like, really? Give me just a second, I can find the actual books that are so much larger. The type is so much larger. And the funny thing about this is that they had the room to make the word, the let the words. Oh, yeah. Bigger. Oh, yeah. Right. They did it. It's like they had all this room. <laughs> I know, why not make them bigger? <laughs> like, wow. No, this is like I can't I can't find it, but originally it was much larger. I can't find it because I, I have a whole set of it that I, I I had in my office. Yeah. So I can't find it. no no. The type was very, very, very large <laughs> compared to that. <laughs> yeah, why? You know, all that white space, why is it <laughs> anyway? All right. Okay, sorry, I couldn't find that. But yeah, just trust me, it was much larger originally. You can actually, you can go to, you can go to Google Images and put in Dick and Jane and find some of the old ones and the, the pages are yellowed, you know. Yeah, you can, you can see what it looked like. Oh, Caroline, oh, your son is doing advanced math. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was so uh, Natalie. We're gonna get the PDF uh, presentation so I can forward. Sorry. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And if you have questions, you can actually email me at info at specialreads.com. All right. That'll get to me. Thank you right. so much, everyone, for spending your morning with us. And uh, hopefully this, uh, this is going to be, you know, uh, beneficial to your child. And 
enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. And thank you, Natalie, for helping us this two, last two weekends. So for giving up your mornings. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much, Natalie. And okay. everyone have a great day. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you so Take much. Care. Take care. Bye bye. Oh, thank you. You're so cute. Goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs>